My name is Michelle Singer. I'm the program assistant for Palm City. I work with the fabulous Rachel Senechal, who you probably just saw walk through the door to make Palm City happen. Uh, so this year we have over 400 poems from over 75 Vermont cities and towns in 100 venues downtown and 44 readings and presentations, of which this is one. So welcome to Palm City. I want to thank the sponsors of Palm City, the National Life Group Foundation, the Vermont Humanities Council, Hunger Mountain Co-op, the Vermont College of Fine Arts, and the Poetry Society of Vermont. Tonight we get to hear the poetry of the Flow Group of Poets, Flo is a group of poets which, which are four left-handers and one right. <laughs> Tonight we have the pleasure of hearing Mary Elder Jacobson, Andrea Gould, and Jesse Lovasco. Uh, you may have seen Mary Elder Jacobson at the Whitman Aloud reading earlier this month, and you can catch her tomorrow night at 7 p.m. at Bear Pond Books, where she'll be reading uh, with others from a new anthology called Healing the Divide, Poems of Kindness. And you may have seen Andrea uh, at the Afternoon of Poetry with local Jewish poets at Beth Jacob Synagogue yesterday. And you can catch Jessica Lavasco's work, both her art and poetry, at the North Branch Nature Center. And a reception for her work is on Wednesday, April 24th at 5 p.m. And she has her book for sale tonight. So lots of ways to see these great women. So please uh, welcome me and join them tonight. Thank you, Michelle, and thank you, Rachel, for all that you have done to make Poem City what it is. So, um, I'm going to start with just saying Lisa Maze and I have been writing poetry together for 14 years, once a month, no matter what, and I actually even moved away, and we still do it um, either FaceTime or over the phone. But after about 10 years, we decided, or I decided, let's extend this. Let's bring in some more people to get some more feedback on our work and uh, do more exercises, get other perspectives. So I invited Susie Atwood, Mary Jacobson, Andrea Gould. And our first exercise that we did when we were sitting down at the table, I realized I was finished first, and I looked around and like, they're all writing with their left hand. <laughs> oh my gosh, this is so weird. So when they were done, I said, I don't know if you all know this, but you're all left-handers and I'm the only right-handed one, so why don't we call our group four left, one right, but W-R-I-T. So then we decided the acronym FLOW, and that's where that came from. So, um, I'm going to read Lisa's poems tonight. She is on a family trip to Greece, and um, I have the honor of reading her work. So the first poem is On Purpose, and it's an experience she had while walking. Um, we were walking together, I guess. I, this is what she told me, and it was slippery and icy. But something that I said made her feel like she could, um, it was a metaphor for no matter what the challenge was, um, she could still move forward. It's called On Purpose. Everywhere, snow decorates branches with delicate lace, muddles the edge between field and forest, sepia as a Charlie Chaplin reel. Everywhere, hush whispers winter, gale force enough to silence ravens and send deer to white pine refuge. Here, ice creaks under my feet, warning of the slip dance beneath. Heart surges, I stiffen, then traverse the frozen layer, slide along, lean into it and hear your voice gently urging me on. Turkey tracks appear in my path, arrows scattered across white expanse, leading the way. <coughs> and the next one is called Speeding, and she actually got a ticket while she was so enamored but with the spring outburst of color and chartreuse, and she wasn't paying attention to the speedometer. <laughs> Speeding. Like a priest hidden in his confessional, he waits, 
<laughs> Stunned out of my morning reverie, I see the blue lights flashing and I know they are for me. I pull over. I have you going 32 and a 25, he said. <laughs> Forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. Sinned because I let out the clutch. So gravity could carry me downhill, summer wind sweet in my hair. Sinned because I glanced at hostas in purple bloom beside a yellow Victorian. Sinned because I sang along with the radio as Bob Dylan earnestly made the case for Medgar Evers. I apologize, I reply, handing over the requisite documents. As I wait for my verdict, I don't dare open the library book I just picked up, <laughs> go through the pile of mail in the passenger seat, or, God forbid, jot down a poem. I wait, penitent. After what seems like a century, he approaches my car window. I'm going to give you a warning this time, ma'am. <laughs> When did I become ma'am? It must be atonement for my sins. <laughs> Thank you. I drive away, wishing I had not thanked him. <laughs> and the next one is, um, we sometimes when we do our monthly exercise, we will read poems from other poets and we will find one line that really you know, speaks to us, and then we'll write up, that will be our inspiration for a poem exercise. So this one was um, to him, but Jess from the book Infernal, and it's called to, S to Claim a Small Part of My People's Anger in His Kodak. What's worth keeping? If no one had told you your grandmother was unstable, refused her lithium, and kept a kitchen drawer stuffed with packages of cream-filled chocolate cupcakes, you might have looked back on that time with the fondness that some have for their memories. You could never have imagined that Wednesday afternoon spent shaping dough into pumpkin ravioli and braising escarole with poppy in your apartment kitchen could end. What if it didn't matter that your parents left to spend a year in Somalia? took you from cobblestone Ferrara to live with estranged grandparents in Kansas. What would remain of those days, eating boiled hot dogs with pickle relish on white buns, going barefoot into the backyard, crouching down for mint, eating it but not daring to show it to your second grade classroom? When you returned to Italy, it was not you who emerged, but a stunned girl wearing the delicate gold bracelet her father gave her, as though to make up for it all. A third grader who stayed after school until she memorized her timetables. And I just want to say all these three poems, this was published in Jet Car Press. Speeding was published in um, in Landia Press, and On Purpose was published in Postcard Poems. So now, our next reader will be Mary Elder Jacobson, and she is a very thoughtful, talented, and dedicated word crafter and poet, and sometimes she even sits on her bed at night with her computer and all her research source books scattered about her like children, and she crafts her poems that way. I always thought that was really cool that she does that. So um, she's, as Michelle said, she's in several of the Poem City events this year, and she has published in the Remembered Arts Journal, Cold Mountain Review, and the Green Mountain Review, to name a few. Please welcome Mary Jacobson. No computer on the bed. I just got to correct that. Oh, okay. Sometimes I iPad, only when my husband's out of town. <laughs> he's a writer journalist, so he's doing a lot of traveling. And then the bed is filled with books. Um, so we're having this weird musical introductions today because Susan Atwood also couldn't be here. Um, she had a course that she wanted to take, and it suddenly conflicted. So I'm going to read some of her poems. Um, and first, I guess I just want to thank Jesse for forming this whole group that we have, because uh, I'll be honest, when I first went, I thought, well, maybe I'll go to one, but I'm not sure, you know. I'm gonna... And 
the women are so great, and um, I think it's been three years now, is that right? Which is hard to believe. And Jessie has moved away, but she keeps coming back, and so we always schedule so that she can be there. Um, so Susan Atwood um, lives on some land off the county road, and a lot of her poems come from her relationship with her own animals, domestic animals, or wild animals. Um, and I was asking her, is there anything you know, in particular you'd like me to say to introduce you? And uh, she, you know, she mentioned that she's always read and loved poetry, but she, then she said this one thing, which I just found so moving. She's working on getting her master's in counseling, and she was required to submit in writing what she does for ongoing self-care. And she noted, and this is what she said, I noted that I read at least, or read at least one poem a day, and on the occasions that I don't for any length of time, I begin to lose contact with what illuminates the world for me. Which I thought was really beautiful. And I was more nervous tonight about reading someone else's words than my own, uh, but she gave me nine to choose from and I chose three, so that made it easier. Speaking of animals, her first poem that I'm going to read is called The Fate of Roosters. And it begins with the word parajito, which is Spanish for little bird. Can you guys hear me all right? Parajito emerged splendid from among the downy chicks. A feathered tapestry, gilt, teal, blue, and cinnamon, a fiery crown of red. He struts and shimmers iridescent as he crows and eyes the yard for foes, mounts his hens, holds forth a raucous jewel in paradise, where I named him Little Bird, to remind him there's an order, a fox and hawk, a danger. Then today he turned his reptilian gaze on me, followed by his new formed spurs, and the world was out of order. Was I predator or hen? So now I brood on husbandry and too on paradise and contemplate the fate of roosters, the fox and hawk a danger, and so am I, and so am I. <coughs> this one I chose because it's where we hopefully are. It's called Winter's End. <laughs> um, <yeah>, please. <laughs> although we're supposed to get a little snow tonight, I heard. Um, winter's End. Just when the restlessness of winter's end, its broken promises and rain, and frosted tips of plum and pear succumb to spring, my own desire buds from deep within. All patience spent, I slip into the garden and dig barehanded in the cool soil thinking green and fertile thoughts about these seeds I plant, made whole by doing the one thing that still makes sense in this uncertain world. This poem is called Openings. Has a child ever crooked his finger at you, stood on tiptoe as you bent down, his two small fists curled so as to tell you a secret, and then simply blown warm, sweet breath into your ear? I felt it again yesterday, walking along the shore, picking berries washed by the sun, the soft green grasses swaying, the waves dancing, the gentle, inviting wind breathing playfully in my ear. And back home, in a large jar on my desk, I studied a pupating moth, who only last week was a big, fat, green caterpillar, now still, leaf bundled, tucked into its private moment of change. And I thought, how does it breathe? And so I discovered the word spiracles, meaning breath, spirit. 
that describes, among other things, the openings through which caterpillars, cocoons, butterflies, caves, volcanoes, whales, and yes, souls, breathe, perhaps in the form of a small child who, if I bend to listen, tells me something I otherwise might have missed. That is worked by Susan Atwood. <laughs> She is uh, working on getting a master's in counseling right now. And I'm going to read uh, three of my own poems. The first poem is up at the drawing board, which I was excited about because it, it's a good match. Um, this poem is called En Plein Air, which is the French term for painting or drawing outside. You know, somebody in this room might have had to do with where that poem got hung, but I'm not sure which one of you it was. <laughs> um, okay. I, was um, I have an art background, and then in the fall I was uh, trying to get revved up again and do more drawing. And um, so I did, uh, took a class with Susan Sawyer at the Studio Place Arts, and it was a great way to spend the dark November evenings. Anyway, this poem kind of came out of that and out of a field near my house. On plain air. The plow draws furrows and contour lines across the hillside from north to south as yellow ochre umber leaves fall from trees, curling downward like fine pencil shavings. And sun, lost in her own gradation studies, sets down her graphite marks in varying degrees, dark and darker darker still, until long shadows stretch from ridgeline trees to cut the fields with cross-hatched strokes that limb from west to east at end of day, to highlight furrows in such enviable ways the artist only dreams of mimicking one day. Another um, outdoor poem. We have some fields in the front and back of our house, and um, where this poem came from was one day I looked out and I saw movement, something fluffy, white, and it was late summer, early fall, and I mistook what I saw for deer's tails. So this is sort of about that. Wild in the Meadow. Wild in the meadow, how all at once they twitch white tufted tails, and then, wind blown, bend down, now nearly hidden, for a minute lost in chest high switchgrass, in gusts of wind, summer's musky air, dusk. I've grown to think each year of this as ours, this perennial herd, neither ruminant nor ungulate this herd, and yet how like them, to keep returning, to let me witness how in our field they stretch and nudge and nose about, rise up, grow wild, grow tame, hold still, lie down again, and every time my surprise is less what they are not or are than who I am, become, will be among them. How knowing from deciphering this is to watch myself, grown lost in this to-do of Queen Anne's lace. To stand again, startled here by every breath, to stare and stare, to wait and see each year how they've come back, how wild, how they scatter. <clears throat> that poem is um, gonna be in an online journal called the Remembered Arts Journal, I'm told um, um, June 1st. It's a really great journal for anybody who's starting to submit things. I think the woman is very responsive and um, they are really great at, um, seems like they publish sort of people from all walks of life or levels of writing and um, let you kind of define who you are. And they have themes and they had a theme that was weeds. So I thought, well, let me <laughs> So I sent that one and she chose that. 
And my last poem, my writing group has not heard yet, but I think I'll bring it to the next. Um, so you guys can all be my writing group tonight. And if you hear anything and you're like, what the heck was that? Or, you know, this could be clearer or something, you can tell me. Um, so this is called the CSEA of Poetry. And it's for Elizabeth Spires, who was my first writing teacher in the first writing workshop I ever took, which was my last semester of my senior year of college. And I'm still in touch with her. And in fact, I think she's the only female teacher I've ever had for writing um, poetry. There is a beautiful poem called First Lesson by a poet named Philip Booth, which is um, a poem of reassurance and encouragement to a daughter. Um, and it has a sort of teaching how to swim kind of metaphor about it. So I use a little epigraph from that um, for this poem that is about um, receiving encouragement in poetry. So the epigraph is from first lesson by Philip Booth. Lie gently and wide to the light your stars. Lie back and the sea will hold you. The Sea of Poetry. Its sparkle catches my eye. Can I? May I go closer? You stood nearby. I could hear your voice. The breezes blew in and whispered, we're sweet, we're salt. The waves rolled in and lessened to not intimidate. And then the words you said to me, yes, you may. I tiptoed into the shallows. I wanted to stay. Poetry lapped my toes. My bare soles tickled as it trickled under, over, around. I wriggled in that same spot, amazed. I was sinking in as the lap, lap, lapping kept happening then. Later on, I'm wading in, no deeper than my knees. I splash and sing, it's all ring around the rosy. Soon, I'm in up to my waist. I can see over most waves, can swim some, can stand and wave to shore. I lie back and float, look up, let go, take in sun and clouds, the sky, all it holds. I bob up and down. I think how I'm held too. Out here in the deep, I am something to see. I can touch the sea floor and still float free. I can see that I'm the buoy I'm now swimming to. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> That's me. <laughs> and now, um, Andrea Gould is going to um, read you some of her poems. and. Um, I was thinking about introducing Andrea, and I actually thought that Queen Anne's Lace was the perfect kind of metaphor because, you know, Queen Anne's Lace is Queen Anne's Lace or it's wild carrot, and so it's either very um, beautiful and decorous and grace filled, and it's also very rooted and earthy. And I think that Andrea and her poetry are like that strong and graceful and deeply rooted. And um, she comes from a background of poetry support. Her husband and her father-in-law are poets, and I believe it's mutual support among them. And um, I really enjoyed getting to know the wide scope of her poetry as much as the details of her rich life. And when I read the Walt Whitman recently, there was a little phrase in it that made me think, Andrea's very humble and modest. Mm -hmm. She says she's a beginner. But Walt Whitman, um, in one part of Song of Myself, he, he refers to himself as a novice beginning yet experient of myriads of seasons. Mm -hmm. Here's Andrea Gold. Mm -hmm. <laughs> start with um, the poem that I have that's in Poem City is at uh, number nine boutique. So I'm going to start with that one. So if you want to go look at it, you can read it again. Um, this one is called For David. 
1950 to 2012. You offered me sushi like an exotic bouquet, taught me to sit Seiza style on a tatami mat and balance smooth black chopsticks between thumb and forefinger. You were cubes of rosy tuna, dipped in shiru, mixed with green mustard. You were hot sake, sipped from a small porcelain cup. You were jellied fish eggs, orange as marigolds, glistening like jewels, sweet, salty, slippery. You were a shoji screen, rice paper, framed by a lattice of bamboo, hiding your interior spaces, mysterious as our brief marriage, until I read your obituary years later, survived by partner Brad. <clears throat> this one, we, what, we always do an exercise. We rotate who is going to, usually it's whose house you're at, but they hardly ever come to my house because I'm kind of out of the way. But, um, <laughs> yeah, we like to come to yours in the summer. Uh, she's right on Curtis Pond. Um, so we did an exercise um, where I had lots and lots of books of art and um, you know, paintings and all kinds of art. People picked a painting and wrote a poem about a painting. So I wrote about um, a painting called White Bull by a painter whose name is Rasika, who nobody's ever heard of. Um, it was painted in 1984. He's still alive. I always love this painting. Um, White Bull. White stucco house, taller than wide, two windows and a door, like a face, like a person startled and saying, oh, like a person wondering why the white bull is turning away. Perhaps he is watching his mate or a newborn calf or hears the rumble of thunder beyond the light gray mountains, or is resting for a moment on a sea of orange poppies under the bleached sky. And the last one I'm going to read is a true story about a chicken that my friend and I found in the dead of winter, frozen, you know, everything was frozen. And um, she, be, she was named Mavis, it turns out. <laughs> well, well, you'll see what happened to Mavis, but anyway, it's a true story. Mavis wasn't like the chickens Monet painted in farmyard in Normandy, plump and plumed, surrounded by piglets, lambs, and the light that stirs the French countryside nor the pair of white chickens strolling amidst gold leaf flowers in Clem's garden path with chickens. Hers had been a modest life, small flock, a few horses, tufts of grass. When the man died and the woman disappeared, it seemed all was lost. Pecking the frozen earth, she forgot rain, green shoots, soft air, the woman bringing grain. But since her rescue, kindness surrounds her, and joy as she releases a perfect oval egg, blue with green spots. So that's what happened to me. Thank you. Thank you. That was beautiful. I, I don't. I didn't know what poems they were going to be reading. Um, this is, I'm going to be reading from my very first book, Imprinting Waves. It comes without the yellow tags, but um, <laughs> by Red Wolf Journal. It's published by Red Wolf Journal. Well, we can add yellow tags if you well, want to Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to start my first poem. Um, I have parents who are 86 and 90. And they are still very much in love and dance in the kitchen and they do everything together. They go to church every morning and um, 
happens to be today, my father's in the hospital, but um, normally they're pretty active and together. So it's called The Beauty of Decay. I notice the small changes in my aging parents. They laugh at each other. One can't find his hearing aid, the other can't bend down to tie her shoe. I see the change in the number of lines on their faces. They realize they are fading. Walking on back roads as the autumn sunlight fades, everything is burgundy, dark green, and gold. Where once plump cherries and apples hung, there are now shriveled and frozen spheres. I still see the parents I knew and who they've become, forgetting what they said and legs that don't carry them as fast. Still, I see in their decay beauty. Two old people holding hands, dancing in the kitchen to Sinatra and hanging on to the last fragments of life like wrinkled fruit on an old tree. And I'm still on my father. He is a daily communicant. He goes to church every day. And um, Jody get gladding occasionally will edit my poems. And she goes, is this true? Mm -hmm. Once you hear this poem, you will I guess the same thing. Mm -hmm. The Light Keeper. My father grows old in his practice of kneeling each morning to pray. In church, there is an altar of candles with 100 flickering lights, where money boxes ensure prayers for suffering souls, and the Blessed Virgin bestows her grace on all who visit. When candles melt down to the bottom of the brown boat of glass, he slides them into his pocket to take home, sets them on the table for the night, then refreshes them with new white wax and wick. He returns them the next day so more intentions can be offered. Then, while neighbors sleep, he walks the streets in search of burned out lamps, twisting and turning the bulbs, replacing them with new ones tending to diminishing light in all the dark corners. So my parents had 10 children, and I'm the oldest. And um, I had, there's twins in there, and they're twin girls. And one of them um, has bipolar. And she had about four bouts of bipolar, like series through her lifetime. But the last one, I always end up walking with her on the water while she's healing from it, because there's always this coming back to normal. And um, this is a story about that, poem and story. Murmuration. I walked along the lake with my sister released from the hospital. We saw layers of birds for a stretch of two miles, wild in their deep nature of migration, murmuration that looked like layers of undulating veils lifting and swirling in spirals with fluttering wings like thousands of black stars. I took her hand and we walked closer to the shore, struck by their grace on open air, the vast sky blowing soft winds through their winter dance. Like my sister's mind, beautiful but startled by sudden flight, thoughts haunting and spinning her course in every direction, flocking together and appearing as though they were true, yet scattered like feathers, who she was now swept away. And all the while I watch her, witness her perfection, as if she is a tiny bird. So 
in that house of 10 children as I was growing up, especially as a teen, I had to find ways to have time to myself. And this poem kind of speaks to that. Horse. Silence was wilderness in a house of many children. I ran like a wild horse with the sound of ocean waves crashing against the shore. I locked my bedroom door and sat in my closet writing. Pen and paper, my bow and arrow. I was inspired by the only landscape I knew, the open page. Found myself bareback, exuberant, galloping over the inner worlds of thought, shaping them into words on paper, gathering them into a corral of poems. Two years ago, I um, left Vermont to go live with my family that all live in Michigan. And um, I had left for many reasons. But on the return, I realized that I was bringing back a new self um, after 20 years of being here not with family. Um, parts of myself came alive that I didn't know how I was going to introduce that to them. but. I created a poem called Authentic Reintegration of the Wild and Sacred. There is no acronym for this phrase. Nothing short describes dying to self. I'll carry wild roots from an oak, drag them 700 miles in bare feet, and watch my soul's blister, my hair dread in four directions. I will carry a sack of sticks and stones, chant sounds of coyote and owl. I will lay down a carpet of leaves, make my home in a grove of trees, and sing out from my heart in sacred notes until they recognize me. So my daughter married a man from Vermont, and his mother and I have become very good friends. And at one time, my daughter and her husband were going through kind of a hard time, and we kind of pulled together and said, we're the outer circle. We need to hold everybody together. The kids need to know that we're together, so no matter if they're fighting or not or whatever, that we're holding that. So this is a story in honor of the two of us. Two grandmothers. Two grandmothers gifted with the same grandchildren grow sage in their gardens, walk up hills side by side on dirt roads, share stories as wise crones. Watched by owl in a tree, past broken barns and eagle messaging the sky. Each season, before the sun rises, they venture on a pilgrimage to an earthen cave, cross an arched stone bridge over trickling water, enter a short elfin door, and sit in the dark and pray. While still, they hold silence like golden threads that weave a circle of ancient women ways, hold their family in unseen love, blowing on embers, maintaining a fire like a promise. I've been fortunate to be at my daughter's birth and in, at one of my daughter-in-law's birth. And um, the other daughter-in-law I wasn't at, but I noticed something, and that was how when the baby cried, how it alerted her. And I started thinking about how each baby's cry is so um, specialized to that mother's hearing. Like, not everyone else hears it in the same way. So I wrote a poem about that. A Mother's Harp. A mother knows her baby's cry. It's deeply instinctual. The note that child strikes high or low sounds upon the harp of the heart, waking her from dreams, 
closing the phone conversation, pulling her away from the stove to care and nourish. Only that note fixes itself inside that mother so that even in a nursery of 20 screaming babies, not an A nor a C, but a D flat plucks the perfect string. <laughs> And then this poem is kind of self-explanatory, and this is going to be the last one. Words. Words stumble out of my mouth, though cathedrals of forest stand behind my eyes. My vocabulary, a barren trail in the vast wilderness of speech. Who am I to call myself a poet when metaphors have a mind of their own? I am still a seed a small acorn trying to describe an oak. Thank you. And thank you all for coming. If you have any questions, we'd love to hear about our, our poetry group and how we work. If you want to come up with me. Does anyone have any questions? I think about know how you work. Do you, you like to, yeah, yes. okay, well. Okay, but anyone else can add. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we meet monthly, and um, each person that we host in different homes, and whatever person is hosting usually is the person that facilitates. And we have different exercises, all different kinds. It's been very eclectic. It's kind of great because you wouldn't get that kind of um, challenge, I don't think, if you're just doing it on your own because everyone looks for something a little special. And we do that for about um, a half hour, you know, 10 minute writings. And then we um, bring poems that we've been working on, and each person gets a a turn to read their poem and then we go around and critique. Some have a lot to say about what they think might need to change and others don't, you know. It, it's it's great. Everyone has different expertise too. Yeah. So that's what we do. Yeah. Yes. I want tonight um, each of you um, explained some of your poem or about that, but do, when you first read your poem to your group, do you do that as well, or just kind of just read it and just see what they then have to say about it? Yeah, we don't usually, usually we just read it, but sometimes somebody will say, um, I, I want to hear anything you have to say, or they might say, I'm just wondering if this makes sense, or, uh -huh. but usually it's sort of a cold read, but cold then after read. the author, reads it, then usually before we talk about it, someone will say, can I read it? And another person reads it out loud. Uh -huh. And so you sort of hear it twice, because we don't read them ahead of time, which has pros and cons. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so. Yeah, that's an important part I missed. Yeah. But reading, we, like we when I have a chance to read the person's poem out loud, at the, I really like to go into it, because it helps me hear it again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, and then after, we always end up talking about well, I was thinking of this, or you know, whatever. Like, you do end up sort of. Do you want to add anything to that? Um, usually, we give some back history to where the poem came from, and you know, the, the meaning of it, or the you know, emotional connection, or some kind. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay. Yes. Is there a prompt? that you've used that you felt like was a really good prompt? Like everybody really got something out of that prompt? Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> gosh, can I remember a particular one? Um, the one you just did. The one, oh. That was great. What is that book called again? Land, 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 help me. With the words? Please. Yeah, um, I brought a book um, that Susie gave me, shoot. Okay, it's so, so this book it, uh, was a bestseller Oh, Robert McFarland. Robert McFarland, Land Forms, or something like that. Anyways, the really interesting 
interesting thing about his work is that there's a glossary after each chapter. And it, it, it's, it say it's on it mountains. It will show Gaelic, British, all these different nationalities of how they would say one, just the word for pond, the, the different ways they express pond or the way water just happens to bend around a rock or you know how we might have one word for flow or you know there's so many other ways but they the words are almost made up by how they sound to the person who wrote them and um, so we ended up writing poems with words we made up and they were amazing <laughs> Mary's was hysterical yeah. but they were amazing poems that came out of making up words um, like Here's a here's a, t a phrase, exilic sky. That was a icy blue sky was exilic. That's how it felt, and that's the word that came out of that. That's an example. So that was kind of great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's fun to do. Let's have a question. Did you, Ellen? Hey, um, I'm curious in terms of the the flow month to month. How often do the poems that you all bring in? end up being ones that grew from the prompts and or how often do you then bring back a revised version of a poem that the group had discussed we've been talking about that we should bring back poems we don't we haven't done that much at all I think a couple times people have brought back a revision but often people do oh often people re revise what they did bring to work uh -huh. and I don't know how much. And some different. just send them into publishing houses and get published. Because <laughs> I am like, we'll see it in class and in, in group, and then, oh my gosh, you publish that? That's awesome. You know, sometimes it just hops, it just goes. But it is a good exercise to bring it back. Yeah. I usually, from the prompt, I usually write an actual poem, and I spend the whole month, and then I work on it for a long time. You know, so I mean, I use, I do it a lot. I find that the prompt usually leads me to something. Yes. Mm -hmm. It might not be the thing I know. It might be a line. It might make just make my mind think about a topic that I hadn't thought about. Mm -hmm. um, we've got a lot of fun things. With, like I brought in a bunch of little figurines, like children's toys and little animals that I had. And this was also based on a, a book of acrostic poems. And we all could just, I think, touching something. So you could pick up the cow or pick up the fish and then write an acrostic poem. And I'm a fan of, I like a little bit of poems, so I'm always throwing that on these guys. Like, mm -hmm. I did a quatrain one. It's just writing a quatrain. Just maybe you have an A, B, A, B rhyme scheme or something like that. Pantoon. We do. It's the one that Lisa did. That was a yeah, very unusual one. It was a... Oh, a guzzle. A guzzle. Um, I might read a guzzle tomorrow night. Yeah, Lisa did a guzzle about bread and it got published. It was really amazing. It was like really amazing. A guzzle, if you want to know. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted like to say that it sounds different than it is. It's G-H-A-Z-A-L. Oh, it's a yeah. Persian or earlier or Arabic form. And it's a poem written using couplets that can kind of be any length. So, you know, um, stanzas of two lines. And the, the first couplet, the last word of each line is the same word. And then each couplet after that, the second line ends with that word. Mm -hmm. And then, <laughs> at the very end, a proper name is in the poem, and usually the name of the author. So, yeah. It's fun. It's really been a nice journey of learning, of writing, and, and expanding and evolving as writers. And, and we're all, we all, you know, are really supportive of each other. So it's it's great. So thank you again, everyone, for coming, and enjoy the rest of Palm City. Mm -hmm. thank you.